Okay, so we are done with transmission lines, but not entirely. Uh, we're going to shift gears, and I find that there are kind of several different kinds of students in this class. There are some students that just did not get, or at least did not enjoy, transmission line theory. But when they get to the fields and the, the vector calculus, oh, they're like uh, a dog rolling around in the dirt. They're just happy as could be. And then there is another kind of student who got transmission lines. It made practical sense. And then they dive into field theory, and it's like a completely different class. And they don't like this part of the material that we're covering. Um, then there's this kind of, this kind of student that loves everything, and there's also the kind of student that hates everything. But uh, you know, it's interesting that there are different, different people get different parts of this course. And I do want to emphasize that there's some continuity. Just because we're not studying high voltage signals on transmission lines doesn't mean the th field theory is a completely different thing. In fact, if we look at the overhead here, let me turn the overhead on. We've mostly been dealing with uh, voltages and currents in this class thus far which is a higher level of abstraction than the field quantities, E's and H's, electric and magnetic fields that uh, a hardcore EMAG engineer would be dealing with. But let's say we had the cross-section of a microstrip. So here's a ground plane, conductive ground plane, the bottom bar, so to speak, conductive top trace, made of really nice metal, Here's a dielectric stuff, epsilon r. When we studied these with these high levels of abstraction, we represented the structure coming out, at least, as two bars, a top and a bottom bar with a voltage drop across them and currents on the top and the bottom. We tracked the waveforms through there. But really, that's just a higher level abstraction um, from, with regards to the fields that are propagating on that line. So for example, let's say there are currents, I, charges, moving out of the top bar of the conductor, part of maybe a current waveform that's traveling down the line. We know from the right-hand rule that there is going to be some magnetic field circulating around. an H field. And in fact, there's going to be some charge on that too, building up at certain spots of the line, making a voltage drop, which of course means that there will be E fields. So recognize that all of those voltage and current solutions that we were going over in the first five weeks of the course are really higher level abstractions from a lot of physical behavior that's really too complicated to roll up your sleeves and solve if you want to understand in a reasonable amount of time what a high speed circuit is doing. We don't need this level of detail for the basics of those circuits. But if we want to get down and analyze the nitty gritty, then we need to understand field theory. In fact, one of the most immediate things that we need to understand is what is the per unit length capacitance and the per unit length inductance on this structure. I kind of gave you some uh, equations as if I just sort of you know, pulled them out of thin air at the beginning of the class. Well, using basic field theory, we can calculate that for any arbitrary structure of transmission line. So maybe we'll set up a couple examples of how to count calculate the per unit length capacitance and inductance for arbitrary uh, transmission line topologies. So that's, that's what, by, by the end of the class, you'll actually be able to figure out how we got those numbers, be able to compute them yourself. So that's a, that's a big linkage to that material at the beginning of the, uh, the class. And when you want to do something kind of creative with your transmission line, something a little out of the ordinary, you got to go back to field theory. You know, this whole field theory could be abstracted to voltages and currents because this structure is essentially Z invariant.
for a very long distance. You go up here, you go up here, you go up here, you get this exact same material and geometrical cross section. Therefore, I can kind of use voltages and currents in that scenario. But there are lots of things that you can do on a circuit board that are a little bit creative. For example, in the world of microwave engineering, you can put these uh, very high dielectric hockey pucks on your circuit board. Like this. Very high dielectric permittivity, sometimes 50, 60s, 100. And it's got a certain shape that if you put it close in, it resonates at certain frequencies. depending on the geometry and the permittivity of the thing. So you can take a transmission line that normally would not be very frequency selective. It transmits the same velocity of propagation and the same impedance, all waves of any frequency traveling down this line. You put this little hockey puck in here that couples to the E field. And all of a sudden, you have a very, uh, at a certain resonance frequency, you will have a very sharp absorption spike and you've just made a very high Q filter. You didn't even really add any circuit components. You just put that little hockey puck there. You can't analyze that system with just voltages and currents. You've got to get in there and look at what the fields are doing to figure out how big should it be, what epsilon R should I choose, uh, how close should I put it to the line. This is one example of many kind of things that you can do on a circuit board that sort of break the assumptions that led to simple voltage and current analysis that we were doing earlier in the class. So all that just to motivate some of the field theory that we're going to learn. Uh, what you'll find, I always think that regardless of whether they actually used vectors or not, uh, your physics 2 class when they taught you the basics of electromagnetism, it was essentially a scalar type of electromagnetism. They might have had some vector relationships in there, but you kind of learn that, oh yeah, uh, direction of travel crossed into my B field is equal to the force on a charge that's moving, right? That kind of thing. Simple right-hand rule stuff. We are going to set up some grown-up problems in this class. We're going to do engineering electromagnetics. And in this day and age, it is not so much important that you get the solution, the numerical solution exactly, that you can solve triple integrals with crazy things in their integrands. What I emphasize more in these next couple of weeks is the ability to set up the problem. We are actually going to set up some very complicated problems, and we are going to intentionally not solve them. Because that is what computers are for. We will instead model some really interesting scenarios that have real life applications using some pretty sophisticated math and field theory and then we will let the computer do its work. So that's what we're about over the next uh, several weeks. The starting place for this lecture is Coulomb's Law in Cartesian space. So, we're going to go back to physics and learn the very basic rule and then build it up so we can solve really complicated pro uh, problems. It'll be a tired review in the first few minutes of the lecture and by the end of the lecture we'll be solving crazy problems. So, let's start with basic Coulomb's law. From physics, we know that two charges, I'll call one Q prime and another just regular old Q, and Q prime will be at the vector point R. Now, in the past, I've often uh, kind of done standalone or vec uh, vector algebra and vector calculus reviews. Uh, sometimes I, I do that. Sometimes I, I do the um, review as you go along approach. And I think that's the, the way that I'm going to try it this time. Uh, we won't actually have any standalone vector algebra discussions. Uh, but I will be sure to introduce every new piece of notation and concept in vector algebra and vector calculus that I uh, introduce. 
you've all seen it before, but you know it doesn't hurt to see it again, especially since some of the notation that electromagnetics engineers like to use is different than what the math department taught you. So here I've got a vector. And remember, at the end of the day, the vectors are only good for one thing, simplifying the notation. Like, there isn't anything that you can do with a vector that you couldn't do with a scalar. It just makes me write less on the board, which is why we have them in our textbooks. So this vector r is a composite of an x, y, and z vector. And let's see, I'm going to call this r prime since I got a q prime there. So r prime in this case is a scalar x component and you stick it on the x unit vector. Uh, like I said earlier in the class, all of my vectors will have arrows over them. I can't do bold on the board like your book does. This is old timey <laughs> convention anyway. And the old school was the best school, wasn't it? Wasn't it? So, so we can, you can do this on your test too. Don't try to bold stuff in. I, I can't read that. X, my unit vectors will have little carrots on top of them. And your book, whenever uh, your book has like an X hat unit vector in the Cartesian coordinate space, it does a bold, I mean the typesetter just goes hog wild here. It always does a bold A to denote that it's a unit vector. And then it, I think it appends the, the actual direction that the unit vector is pointing as a subscript to that. I'm not going to do that. It's X hat. It's a unit vector in the X direction. That's what that means. So. And let's put primes on these. There's an x component, a y component, and a z component, a collection of three scalars to denote the position in space, r prime. I represent that with just a simple r vector prime. Units of meters. Because each of these scalars as units of meters. They're a position in space. X prime, Y prime, Z prime. X hat, Y pr hat, Z hat are unit vectors. And ironically, unit vectors are always unitless. Isn't that weird? They are. They are. Now this other charge will be at the position R vector and we'll use non-primed x, y's, and z's to denote the difference in position. And of course you learn in physics that if you have a charge Q prime present, there is going to be a force acting on that system. <coughs> Sometimes it's going to point away if these are the same charges. Sometimes it's going to point towards the charge if they're opposite. That's the basic of Coulombic attraction. And you learned in physics that this followed this uh, formula. Your F vector is equal to minus F prime. So the force on this uh, charge is equal and opposite to the force vector on this charge, F prime, the force on this charge due to the presence of that charge, and is given by the following equation. Q prime times Q, the product of the charges, 4 pi epsilon, where epsilon is the permittivity of the medium of these charges, in farads per meter, and I got to do uh, distance squared. That is the distance separating these two charges. And I got to have an A hat unit vector because we need a unit vector that points away from that first charge to get the signs right. And of course, the actual polarity of the signal, you can see resolves mathematically from the product of these two charges. If they're the same charge, you get a positive number and thus the force is away. If it's the diff opposite charges, it flips the sign and it's attractive. Basic physics, basic physics. Okay, now I'm gonna massage this into a more useful formula for us uh, uh, electrical engineers in this next board over here. First of all, recognize 
that my distance R, capital R, in that diagram, is really the Pythagorean distance between the two points, R prime and R. And I can write that out longhand as x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared plus z minus z prime squared. And here's an example where things start to get pretty tedious if I need to carry this thing around all the time. So of course there's a much nicer way to write this, and that is the magnitude of the vector form by taking r and subtracting r prime. So when you take a vector that represents one position, we call it r, and we take the end point, r prime. Subtracting r from r prime is like going from head to tail and forming a new vector in that direction. And then we take the norm of it. Those two lines that I've drawn, instead of just one line, they indicate the Pythagorean norm. So you could write this if you wanted to. It's just like the square root of the vector dotted with itself to get the distance. This is just a nice shorthand way to write distance. And I use two lines instead of just one to denote that we're not just taking the scalar magnitude. Remember when we had a complex number v e x b to the j phi, this would give me the value v, the real amplitude of that phasor. But this is still a scalar. Now, in the future, we're actually going to have some E fields at the end of the course that are vectors and phasors. So they could be like complex vectors. That, then it becomes a little bit more uh, important to distinguish the difference between the double thing that's the Pythagorean distance of a vector, or the two norm of a vector, and uh, the magnitude of a scalar. So just wanted to point out that use of terminology that convention that I'm using. Okay, so that's one simplification. I'm going to write R as this value here. I can also calculate A. Remember, A is a unit vector. Let's give it a hat so we know it's a unit vector. And it points away from R prime as observed from R, my point of observation here. And if that's the case, then the vector r minus r prime actually points in the direction of, of uh, the unit vector a. But of course, it's not a unit vector. It doesn't, just because I subtracted two values, uh, two vectors from one another, doesn't mean that it's going to have a unit length. What do I have to do to it to make sure that it has a unit length? Yeah, that's right. Divide by the magnitude. I normalize it. So I say, oh, if I want to make this a unit vector, I just take the length and I divide by that length. Ah, much better. So now, our, our electrical engineering um, expression, when we go to write the E field at any given point R, the definition of that, and, and again, notice I've made this as a function of a vector. And the function is actually a vector itself. It's very important to not to confuse those two things. We're taking three inputs of position, units of meters, and we're getting a, a something at a single point represented by a vector that has three components as well, units of volts per meter. It's very easy for early on students to kind of conflate the input with the output. They're both vectors and, you know, in their mind, it can get very confusing. Uh, I know it, it was when I was an undergraduate, so when seeing the stuff for the first time. So just recognize we got inputs of distance, outputs of volts per meter. A vector at a point in space observed at, at the R vector point. So this is equal to, by definition, we define E field to be whatever force is on, on the charge Q 
due to whatever charges are present, divided by the charge Q itself, which conveniently simplifies everything down to Q prime. Notice the Q divides out. The force is always proportional to the amount of charge. Double the charge, double the force, which is why this normalized quantity makes a useful field um, quantity to observe as a definition for electric field. It's only a function of the stuff around it, not itself. So the stuff around it, we have a point charge Q prime. I've got 4 pi epsilon in the denominator. I have 1 over r squared, which is the magnitude of the distance between my point of observation and the point where the charge lives. So I should have a square there. Oh, but wait. I need an a hat, which is itself r minus r prime. And I got to pick up another magnitude. So I have magnitude to the 3 power. So wait a second. Does that violate anything that you learned in physics? When I've got two point charges, the E field should, or, and thus the forces on them should fall off 1 over separation distance to the square? Why do I have the third? Well, this is really 1 over r to the squared separation distance. I just had to pick up that extra one to normalize the vector up here. So don't be thrown off that this is suddenly a third instead of a second, like your, t your physics textbook. Any questions so far? This is a key result in units of volts per meter. OK, now let's build on it. Now let's say I had a whole bunch of charges. A collection of point charges. Let's say I got a Q sub 1 here, and that's at the point R sub 1, represented by a vector. Q sub 2 at the point R sub 2. Q sub 3, the point vector R sub 3, and so forth. Lots of charges all the way up to Q sub N. Well, luckily, E fields and forces superimpose, which means all you have to do is calculate the individual E fields for each of these quantities, add them up. And that's your total E field. And that's easy enough to do. My expression in that case is E as a function of R, my point of observation. Let me write that down so it's in your notes. Point of observation is equal to the summation from n equals 1 to capital N of Q sub N R, my point of observation, minus whatever point I'm picking up in the summation, R sub N. This is my variable of summation. I'm changing the position to all the different charges in my system. And I'm just using that same single point charge result inside each summed term. You see, we're building a little bit of complexity into here. Now we can have an arbitrary number of point charges and use this same expression. So, well, that's good. That's good. Now keep in mind that even if my point charges stay the same, depending on where my point of observation moves around, I will have to go back and resum this expression. Yes? Um, for the, um, R's, R, um, oh, yeah, it's written. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Cut, cutting and pasting from the board. 
without modification. Okay. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Now let's try something a little bit more complicated. We already see that if you have a whole bunch of charges, you get this really nice expression that superimposes with the summation. Now we're going to take those little bits of charge, we're going to make them even smaller. We're going to dice them up so that you can really represent them with a charge density, something that has units of coulombs per meter cubed. You basically dice up all those little charges and then sprinkle them uniformly in an area. You can increase or decrease the density as a function of space, but uh, the point is now we've got a quantity that uh, a function of cool in terms of coulombs per meter cube that now represents a continuum of charge, an infinite number of t infinitesimal little charges, if you will. And it's actually a little bit more realistic in the physical models um, to to describe charge in this way because unless you've got like an atom with this tiny little uh, uh, positive nucleus that really is a point charge, and this electron, which is a tiny little negative charge that really is a point charge. You know, most, most charge is distributed. It's thousands or millions or an uncountable number of electrons dispersed throughout a medium. And we needed some more complicated constructs to model those situations. So I'll quick show you how to adapt this formula for the volume charge distribution the surface charge distribution, and the line charge distribution. And we'll know everything we need to know about point, uh, Coulomb, Coulomb's law in uh, Cartesian space. Now we'll work a couple examples. The examples that we work, unlike the examples that we will work next class period, will actually have nice tractable solutions. There's the cute ones that the, the uh, professor loves to go over in the physics class or the math class, because they have nice answers. Um, and then, just let me tell you, don't get used to that. Because when you get to your homework, it'll be perfectly acceptable to simplify without solution. Just set it up properly, simplify it, and then you're done. And we'll do examples of that when that, when that comes up. So now, let's talk about the volume charge. Uh, the convention in, in EMAG is to represent uh, charge distributions with the variable rho. I sometimes put a little catch on the end of it to denote it from the other kind of rho, which we also use for the cylindrical coordinate system. It is a bad sign when your profession is running out of Greek variables and has to reuse them in their problems. But we'll get by. So rho with a little v as a function of space. It has units of coulombs per meter cubed and is our volume charge density. So there are basically two quantities that we want to compute in this class. So you know, imagine we have a point of space with a volume, let's call it v. defined by a surface enclosing an area. And of course, this rho sub v as a function of position represents the distribution of charge. It can go positive, it can go negative. In a lot of the examples that we work for simplicity, it'll be assumed to be uniform. There are a lot of scenarios where that actually holds. But you know, there's some value in coulombs per meter cube that undulates across this voltage and represents the distribution of charge in that volume. If that's the case, there are two quantities that I would be interested in computing from this. One is the total enclosed charge. Q is going to be the integral over the volume V 
of my volume charge density as a function of R prime integrated with respect to V prime. Now, notice a couple of things. It's a very simple integral. All I'm doing is really adding up the coulombs per meter cubed over a volume of meter cubed, and I will get something that has units of coulombs. If this is the Cartesian uh, coordinate system, and you can think of this as being a volume defined in x, y, and z. And of course, in that case, my dv prime, my differential volume element, will be dx prime, dy prime, and dz prime. And I'd have corresponding limits over here in my triple integral when I broke it out. Yes? Why is it r vector prime? Ah, okay, you're getting to the, my next point. So, um, whenever I integrate inside, uh, over an area or a volume or a line, I always put primes on my position dependencies. So, for example, this dv prime, I put a prime there because I'm going to represent this with x prime, y prime, z prime. Over here, this r vector prime we said was x prime, y prime, and z prime stuck on their corresponding co uh, unit vectors. It doesn't make a big deal in this integral, but for the next formula that I put on the board, it helps to avoid the single most common mistake in junior level field analysis, and that is confusing your point of observation with your variable of integration, because they both exist in the same expression. So for example, this guy, all, all I get here out of this integral is a number, something in units of coulombs, the total charge in this volume. If I say, OK, here's a volume in space of charge. Tell me what the field is at the point R. Well, Dr. Durgan? Oh, yes. Could you write that? Um, is that x prime or x x unit vector plus this y y unit vector? That's right. Yeah, it, it, a little bit. The plus it looks like a times on our screen. Oh, is it too small for the video camera? Yeah, yeah. That's sorry fine. about you that. See that now. There we go. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So <clears throat> now let's say. What is the electric field at point R vector? So really what we're solving for is a vector quantity that is itself a function of where you're observing it, R. And the strategy for constructing this integral is very simple. We're going to take our basic superposition idea, and instead of a discrete summation of point charges, we're going to need to do a continuous integration in three-dimensional space. And the problem is, there are now two vectors in our analysis. One is r, without a prime. That's our point of observation. That's not going to change when we evaluate the integral. But we're going to need another variable to slide around this volume and pick up all those positive and negative charges that might exist there as described by the volume charge density. I, I guess I don't understand it. If, if it's a volume, why should your direction matter? Because looking this way or that way, the area is still going to be the same. So I would think that even if you use the other vector, it should come out to the same value. I, I'm just let, let, let me write it and you'll see that you would get a completely different result if you if you could. Uh, confuse the two vectors. Let me finish writing the, the integral here. So this guy would be a volume integral, same volume, the volume V. I would be integrating my volume charge as a function of R prime, my variable of integration. I got to use my same kernel for Coulomb's law. So what I'm going to have in here, I'm going to have my X R minus R prime 
over 4 pi epsilon magnitude r minus r prime to the third power and I didn't leave myself enough room on that side of the board so I'll squeeze it in over here. My differential element will be dv prime with respect to x prime and y prime and z prime. If I took the primes off and I integrated with just respect to x and y and z, I would get a completely different result because you see these are not commutable. In the kernel they look like they are, but not in the charge density. What you're saying with that integral expression is I'm going to take my r prime, I'm sliding it around the volume v, all the while holding this, treating it as a constant. And that way you pick up the fact that, oh, this part of the volume might be a little bit closer. And so I've got to adjust this and add that into my, fold that into my integration. And then this part over here is a little bit farther. So when I slide down here with my integration, I pick up that distance dependence. And this is where the, the class starts to become a real, it's like going to the mind gym for conceptualization. You know, some people, um, that's a real struggle for. Um, and I don't know what the, the solution is other than just maybe to work some problems and, this is the, the calc, is it the calc 3 part of the class? Is that cal multivariable in Georgia Tech? Mm -hmm. Good. A lot of conceptual stuff. Okay, one well, last thing. Yeah, sure. So if it, were, if it were two identical spots or volume spaces that were close to each other, and we're looking from the center of mm -hmm. each one, then we could, we could do it each way. Then we could evaluate the either way and we would come out with the same answer. Well, so, so if we had two identical volumes with identical charge distributions in there, uh, the, the meaningful part of the problem would be, okay, what is, the, if there's a charge distribution in this one and it's identical over here, you're not when you measure E field, you're just saying what is the E field due to the charges present in the world at a certain point in space R. So you can move R into here, but you'd still actually have to, you'd have two integrals. You'd be integrating over this volume and this volume. What if you say, what is the effect felt only from the fields in that, in that, in that V1? Oh, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, then, then you would pick your point of observation, keep it fixed, and then you'd slide around that and you just have one integral to add up to the E field wherever it may point in that particular location. Now, if I put that at a point, like say, that's perfectly balanced in between the two, then there can be some symmetry in the situation that would say, well, without even calculating, I know that whatever is coming over here is going to cancel this one over here, so I'm going to have no E field if it's perfectly balanced in there. I don't even need to compute the integral to that. We'll see a couple examples of that in the um, examples we work on these problems where you can bring some symmetry into the, the problem and even though if you did the math you'd get the same answer, you can just look at it and say, well, this is not going to have a Z component of the E field or an X component of the E field. Is that kind of what you were asking? S symmetry kind of behavior? Okay, okay. So one thing it does help to, to, to write this out, it's very tedious, but it's probably a good exercise to do once. When you see vectors flying around inside of an integral, uh, it can be a little bit intimidating. But we have to recognize that really what we're writing in longhand notation, this thing down here, is that my E field vector as a function of x, y, and z coordinates in three-dimensional space is equal to triple integral over some sort of volume with the proper limits of 
my charge density rho sub v as a function of x prime, y prime, z prime. And in longhand notation, that difference vector that I originally wrote over there is going to be x minus x prime. Stick it on the x hat. y minus y prime. Stick it on the y hat. z minus z prime. Stick it on the z. 4 pi epsilon x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime squared plus z minus z prime squared. And this, i got to take the square root to get the norm, but I've got three of them. So i got to take this to the 3 halves power. And this is all being integrated with respect to dx prime, dy prime, and dz prime. I did not have room to put my little element of integration in on the right hand side because I ran out of board. But as you'll see, a lot of EMAG professors like to put them corresponding to their appropriate limits anyway. That's a very common way to write an integral. Otherwise, you've got to write them out and make sure that they sort of go from inner to outer elements corresponding to your limits of integration. You can see this is a very long-handed way to, to write this integral out. Look how much we save by writing it with these elegant vector notations. Can everybody go from here to here? If you know what, what r prime is, what regular r is, which volume element of integration. It's a fairly trivial exercise, but it gets pretty big. And even there, I'm using a little bit of... Uh, of a vector notation to, to simplify things. Because really, at the end of the day, this is actually three different equations, right? There's an x component of E field. And it's a function of x, y, and z. And it's really this portion of my integral expression have two more of these for my y and my z component. I'd take up the entire board writing this in scalar uh, mathematics if I didn't want to use vectors. So buck up, plow through that vector notation because I don't think it's that hard for, for you students and uh, it saves you a tremendous amount of work. It saves your instructor a tremendous amount of work. I won't ever do this again to you. Any questions so far? So I've got two quantities there. For completeness, I'm going to go ahead and write down the, the integrals if you are given a surface charge density in coulombs per meter cubed squared or a line charge. Um, and then we'll work some examples. As well. How do we actually apply this to a realistic situation? Semi-realistic to start with. Okay, so now if we can have a volume charge density. We can surely have a surface charge density. And that is, of course, you have some sort of sheet of current. Let's call this a surface uh, S. And there's charge on it. Negatives or and or positives of varying densities. And we have a quantity rho as a function of r prime. And again, I'm going to keep the prime there to denote that 
when I put it in an integral, it, I'm going to need a variable of integration that's different from my point of observation. I subscript this with an S to denote that it's a surface charge. And it has units of coulombs per meter squared. So naturally, if I want to calculate the total charge on that sheet, I will have to integrate <clears throat> over the surface S. Rho sub S as a function of R prime. And I got a DS prime. <laughs> now keep in mind that uh, right now I've kind of drawn it in the most general mathematical sense. Uh, this kind of undulating curve that has charge sprinkled all over it. Uh, in our problems, usually it's going to be nice and planar, so it's a little easier to solve. Um, and a lot of things are modeled that way as well. You can model them with planes or approximate planes. So this is kind of this really elegant term, uh, elegant notation to write the surface integral in. But quite often we'll be just doing integral with respect to say dx prime, dy prime, if the surface is on the xy plane. We'll try to align our problem so that it's easy to set up in Cartesian space. If not, then we may have to pick another uh, coordinate system to work the problem in, where things line up and it all, the math all falls out very easily. E field, E at a given point R, is equal to the surface integral. And of course, we're going to be integrating with respect to two positions instead of three positions in our volume integral. So to just always check, you know, this is coulombs per meter squared. I'm going to integrate out those two meters in the denominator, and so I should have something that has units of coulombs out here. Remember, when you integrate over a dependency, you basically pick up those uh, units in your numerator. So this is position and position for surface. If it was volume, it would be position and position and position. It's a line integral, it would be just position. So keep your units in, in check and uh, keep tracking them as you work through your problem. Ah, yes? Uh, for the E field, why is it just R and not um, why is this R and not R prime? Because the way that we're going to pro set up this problem, I'm going to have a point of observation. And the problem, when you solve for an E field, you have to specify what point you're going to solve it at, because it's different depending on which point. And then you're going to have to slide around with that R prime and pick up all the points of uh, the variables of integration, where all those charges actually are, and how they accumulate the con contribution there. So the R prime is on the surface. That's right. That's right. The, the R prime, the, so, so at the end of the day, this should be a function of X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. And this should also be a function of X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. That's why I put primes on both of them. In the generic sense, when you're doing like the real fancy mathematician's no notation, we say, we have an arbitrary curved surface of any functionality possible, any dimension in space, with any arbitrary car charge distribution. Then you kind of have to write it in this form, and because you haven't resolved the shape of it to specify these two things. But they're related. They're functionally dependent on one another. OK, so let's write this out. Rho sub s, surface charge is a function of r prime times the vector r minus r prime ds prime in the numerator and this is multiplied by 4 pi epsilon magnitude r minus r prime raised to the third power in the denominator. Exactly the same kernel. I'm just integrating twice instead of three times with respect to x, y, and z, and I'm doing that with respect to a surface charge density, coulombs per meter squared instead of coulombs per meter cubed. Got a couple points here. To check to make sure your math is good, remember here, this is a scalar quantity. So even though there are vectors in here, I should wind up with a scalar quantity. This is not 
the variable rho sub s times the vector r prime. This is the variable rho sub s as a function of r prime. It gets a little bit confusing because you go down here and people want to say, oh, this is rho sub s times r prime vector times this other vector. I can't even multiply vectors, but darn it, I'm going to do it anyway. No, 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 no. This is a scalar function. Its inputs are three dimensions, x prime, y prime, z prime. And it multiplies this vector. Everything else in here is also a scalar. So at the end of the day, when I integrate that scalar times this vector, I should get a vector. And E field is a vector quantity. So again, do that sanity check. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many points over the years students could have reclaimed on their test if before they handed it in, they just looked at the problem, they wrote it, and said, OK, I need a vector quantity. I should have vectors on the right-hand side of my equal sign. I have vectors in my integral, so I, so I wind up with the vector. And vice versa. OK. So not to beat a dead horse, but this is your surface charge density. And let's, for completeness, write the integral that you would use for your line charge density. So let's say I have a line, L, a line in space with charges on it. And of course, it could be positive or negative or a combination thereof. And you would describe that charge density, rho sub L, as a function of three-dimensional space. It has units of coulombs per meter saying how total amounts of charge are spread out continuously on this line. And if I wanted to figure out the total charge on the line, I would have to integrate with respect to that along that line, however meandering the path may be. And I would have to uh, just take rho sub L r prime, and I'd have to integrate over dl prime, whatever path that took. Now again, in our class, if we've set the problem up cleverly, uh, that path will usually align itself with an axis, the x-axis or the z-axis. So this will become from integral from z equals minus a to plus a, and then this will be a dz prime. And then this will really only be a function of z prime. You have to worry about all those extra dependencies. But in the generic form, I have to write it like this because we haven't, this is the gener general formula. You have to bring it to the specifics when you go to set up the problem. E field at an arbitrary location, arbitrary point of observation. is equal to the integral over that path, rho sub L, r primed, times r minus r prime, dl prime in the numerator, and the same old song in the denominator. So hopefully in your notes now, you have everything. You've got all the forms of Coulombic repulsion and attraction for calculating total charge and E field. In the case of a point charge, multiple point charges, line charge, surface charge, volume charge. So now let's go ahead and, and work a couple of canonical examples. And these are kind of cute in that they will actually give you uh, closed form expressions. Don't get used to it. Any real problem in Emac doesn't have a closed form expression, but all of them can be set up in the same manner that I'm doing here.
So example one, line charge. In this problem, I'm going to start off with my Cartesian coordinate system, x, y, and z. And you'll always notice when I write my a coordinate system on the board, I, I click discreetly do a little right-hand rule just to make sure I didn't accidentally write a left-handed coordinate system. And for my line charge, I'm going to have charge distributed in this problem from the minus a point to the plus a point. And it will be uniform. In other words, the coulombs per meter charge d density along this line is going to be the same no matter where you observe it. Rosabelle. So Rosabelle is a constant. It doesn't depend on x prime and y prime and z prime. That's convenient because it simplifies the math a little bit. And that's also a very, very uh, common thing to study. Uh, working through this charge integral, you know, one of the things you have to ask, even these canonical problems have interesting analogs in the real world. If you've got a piece of wire with charge on it, well, if it's positive charge, think, oh, this is a good integral to work through. Well, what happens if you put a non-uniform charge on here? So, for example, you have maybe a sinusoidal taper of charge that either is, say, at a maximum here and a minimum here and then changes polarity on the bottom. So that's, you'd use the same integral that we're going to use to solve this problem, but you'll actually be re representing an interesting problem, uh, a dipole antenna. As it oscillates and charge builds up on the extremities and then relaxes, then builds up and then relaxes, there are points at which it looks like that distribution of electrostatic charge. And you can glean some information about the near field uh, behavior of that antenna by studying the same integral. So a lot of times, there are even in these little canonical problems, there are analogs to more advanced engineering studies. Uh, so always, always, don't be afraid in this class to raise your hand and say, "What, what good is this? Why are we doing all this math?" Okay. And so we have a line charge uniformly distributed between minus a and plus a. And so the question then is. What is the electric field on the xy plane? So we're going to pick any arbitrary spot here. And we're going to calculate. That's going to be a point of observation. We're going to calculate what the E field is. And in fact, this problem, and here's, here's our first example of how to simplify what would normally be a very complicated EMAG problem. This problem has radial symmetry, right? So if I found the solution for the E field at a point R on the x-axis, I could then twirl that solution around, holding the distance the same, and I would get the same result. I'd have to translate and rotate all of my vectors along with it. But the point is, if I, got an e, if I observe E field here, it's going to have the same magnitude any distance around there. So this provides a convenient simplification. The mathematicians would say, without any loss of generality, we will solve we will solve the problem E field at the point X and we'll hold Z equals zero because we're on the XY plane and we'll hold Y equals zero too just to simplify it because we know that once we have that solution we can twirl it around and I'll show you what you mean when the thing what I mean when a thing pops out so this is the problem that we're actually gonna solve this is going to be equal to, well, I've got to write one of these line integrals. Luckily, everything is aligned on the z-axis. Oh, yes? I'm sorry. All right. Let's say you find that you feel at point x, but the distance that point x is is shorter than the distance that r is. 
Yes, that's right. So, so this solution here, if this is x, that would only correspond to the magnitude where rho, the distance from here to here, is the same as x. So if, if I wanted to point out here, you're right, I would have to swing down and make sure the x that I used corresponded to that value. All right, so would, doesn't it make more sense to calculate, to use, use the two y, x and y coordinates to calculate the actual position in r and then move it to x and then do that work? Um, I think this way is going to be easier. Okay. I'm just you, can, you, can, you can give it a try that way uh, and see if it's more more paperwork, but I think this way is going to be easier. Let's work through it and then uh, we'll, we'll see the end result. I can do a little quick algebra trick and then transform the result at the end this way. But unfortunately, I don't want to spoil the punchline yet. I want to do the math because I love it. Okay. So, let's see. I need a path of integration. Well, clearly this is going to be on the z-axis and I'm going from minus a to plus a. My dl prime in the general formula is really just in the z-axis, so it's dz prime. My rho sub l is a constant. It's going to be a constant value. I'm eventually going to be able to take it outside the integral. It's not even going to contribute any dependency on z prime to, that needs to be integrated. I could put it in there. It just make the math a little bit harder. Let's see. What else? Well, keep in mind that my point of observation is really x, stick it on the x, plus nothing, stick it on the y, plus nothing, stick it on the z. My variable of integration, the vector that slides up and down to pick out the contributions of all this, is going to be 0, stick it on the x, zero, stick it on the y. And I, I know that some of you may already be able to do this. You can do all this kind of in your head. You don't have to go through these excruciating steps. But it's, it's very good first starting out these problems to go ahead and do this painstaking right out because it'll save you some errors and, and problems later. Then when you get more comfortable with it, you can just kind of look at it and say exactly what's going to be in that integral. So I've got point of observation, variable integration, the thing that's sliding up and down. You'll notice that in that formula, the difference appears quite a bit. R minus R prime, it appears in the numerator and the denominator. And in this case, it's going to be x, stick it on the x, everything else is 0, minus z prime, stick it on the z hat. Make sense? Everybody tracking so far? Okay. So then I'm going to write that value up here. X, stick it on the X hat, minus Z prime, stick it on the Z hat. Very systematic way to solve these problems. 4 pi epsilon, and then I've got this magnitude. Why don't we have two vector elements? How do I take the magnitude of this? It's really just the Pythagorean length of the vector. x squared in the x component, negative z prime, which is just z prime squared in the z component. There is no y component, so I don't have to square that. And that's the, the magnitude of that. So when I go over here in the denominator, I write x squared plus z prime squared raised to the one-half power. Ah, but it occurs three times, so I've got to raise it to the three-halves power. And that's pretty much it. We have set up our problem. If this, uh, There's one more thing we can do, and that I would expect you to do at this point based on this problem. Let's say these are all positive charges up here, and I'm, I'm on the xy plane midway between the line segment that carries all of those charges. We know that if I put a little test charge there, that's how I measure the field, right? I measure the force on that thing, and then I divide it by the magnitude of the charge, and I get an E field that, in this case, would point away because that's positive. E fields always point away from positive charges, and they always collapse onto negative charges, point towards positive, negative charges. So if I'm observing at a point X out here, 
I've got contributions up here that are contributing E field that points this way. I've got contributions up here that points E field down this way. Notice each of those has like an X and a Y component to the field. However, by symmetry, as I slide all the way up, I will pick up an equal and opposite amount of Z component that will cancel. The X component will always be pointing outwards, so that won't cancel. And therefore, I can actually take this integral, and it's actually two integrals, right? It's the integral of this thing minus the integral of this thing over here. But that Z component is going to go away because of the symmetry argument. Now, if you're one of these people that, that struggles with the uh, 3D conceptualization of the symmetry arguments in this class, they, don't worry. There are always alternate ways to skin the cat. Some people can just take a look at this and say, well, yeah, look. If I, I'm not observing an E field there, and I get equal uniform charge density on either side above the XY plane and below the XY plane. And of course, when I finish my integration, I'm going to have something that's only pointing in the X hat direction. You can just use visual inspection for the symmetry. That's a perfectly valid way of doing that. Right on your, t on your homework or your, your test question, you know, by visual inspection, this component is zero. If you have trouble seeing that, then just go over here and look at this. My point of observation x does not depend on z prime. It, it's like a constant, so I can basically pull this out. What I'm left with is an even function. This is a positive value that will be the same regardless of whether it, I put an x here or a negative x here. I've got an even function with respect, to, or yeah, with respect to z, and it doesn't matter whether I move. Um, if I if I integrate minus a below the z equals zero plane and plus a to plus a above the z equals zero plane, if this is even with respect to z prime, what I'm doing is I'm integrating this even function across symmetrical limits. So the area under that curve, of course, is going to be a non-trivial number. When I go to integrate this part, I got a z prime in the numerator. That turns it into some sort of odd function. I don't know what it looks like, but it's, it's an odd function. And so when I integrate across symmetrical limits, this positive part is going to negate this negative part. And I'm going to lose that contribution in the entirety of the summation. So you see there's a mathematical way to argue that. And there's a look at it way to argue it, right? A visual or conceptual way to, to argue it. Both are valid in this class. Some people take to one versus the other. You can use one to check the other. You say, oh yeah, that's clearly an odd function. And I'm integrating it across symmetry. So I better get zero. So all that to simplify the results so we can do as little math as possible. And so if this was a complicated problem, and this was a test question, and I said, OK, solve this as best you can, the next step would be your last step. You would write, after you've recognized there was symmetry to the problem, e as a function of x. Zero, y equals 0, z equals 0 is equal to rho sub L is a constant, so I'm going to take it outside the integral. x is a constant, x hat is a constant. 4 pi epsilon naught is all constants. I'm integrating from minus A to plus A. And whatever's left over in there is just dz prime x squared minus z prime squared to the 3 halves. And for all intents and purposes, this problem is done. Now, I'm going to finish it off because it turns out that that's a pretty standard integral. You can cheat and look in the back of your calculus book and pull it out. So for example, I look at the back of the calculus book and I find this thing is actually equal to 
1 over x squared z prime square root of x squared plus z prime squared. And I just have to evaluate it from minus a to plus a. Let's see, what is that equal to? From minus a, I put that into z prime, that's squared in the denominator, uh, and I got a minus a there. Oh, but that's subtracted, so that becomes a plus a, and I have a plus a there leading there. So I have a over x squared plus a squared divided by x squared, and the same thing when I put the minus sign in. So it really just doubles the quantity. So what I'm really left with is rho sub l x x prime, 4 pi epsilon naught. 1 over x prime, and we said it would double the amount, and we stick a's wherever we see z primes. Everybody see how that evaluates out like that? And now let's do just a little bit of simplification. x cancels with one of those x's, 2 cancels with one of those 2's, and what I'm left with is rho sub l a 2 pi epsilon x over the square root of x squared plus a squared. And that, of course, is in the x hat direction. Are we done yet? Well, kind of. I don't ever want you guys to be completely done until you've thought about what you've written down, though. A really good way to check yourself is to look at things like limiting cases. So for example, does this, does this even make sense? Well, I'm going to do a little sneaky grouping here. This is the same as the quantity 2a rho sub l in the numerator over 4 pi epsilon naught x times x squared plus a squared in the x hat direction. Remember, this is a line length going from minus a to plus a of a bunch of positive charges. And I'm over here on the x-axis observing the E field. What is this quantity? Why did I group these together? What physical quantity is this? To <coughs> Well, rho sub L is charge density on the line, coulombs per meter. This is the total line length in meters. This is the total charge on the line. And you see, I've got an expression here that's more complicated than the point charge formula. But if x starts to move really, really far away, if x becomes large, then this dominates in this square root term, I can ignore the contribution of adding a little a squared to it. And I got the square root of x squared, which is, which is just x. I have another x out here. And so, for big x, this is really just total charge in the x hat direction over 4 pi epsilon x squared for my E field. In other words, it looks exactly like a point charge. When you've stepped away from that line charge, it looks like a tiny little concentration of charge in space, and lo and behold, you recover the exact same Coulomb's formula that depends on 1 over distance squared. Those are the kind of sanity checks that can really save you on an exam, because it makes sense that, that uh, you can check that limiting case. And it reveals some interesting behavior. So for example, if x is really small, is a very tiny value, then the opposite is true, right? This thing dominates. And you wind up getting 1 over x times 1 over a behavior. Field strength close into the wire falls off just 1 over x instead of 1 over x squared, and then transitions into 1 over x squared. Interesting behavior. And we've pretty much Dr. solved Gardner. this problem. Oh, yeah, question? What is the subscript on that last cube? Let's see, this one? 
Yeah, totally. uh, I put an epsilon naught as if it was free space. Oh, oh With this no, one. The, uh, Q above this. Oh, I, I put a TOT because uh, I just picked that out of the air. It's total charge. Okay, see you Tuesday. Well, where are we and where are we going? Last lecture period on Thursday, uh, we started a completely new unit, electrostatic fields. It's not completely new in the sense that really it's just a lower level abstraction of analysis of the stuff we were doing in transmission line theory. When you were calculating voltages and currents on a transmission line, you were really tracking the movement of charge and the presence of fields, magnetic and electric, around those transmission lines. You just didn't realize it. They were just kind of all lumped into one parameter, voltage or current. Well, here we're getting into the nitty gritty. And the very first question you always ask yourself when you get into electrostatic fields is, if I have charge, what is the electric field around that? So last class period, we um, defined what the electric field was, and we developed uh, several different flavors of the same integral that's used to calculate electric field from charge. So basically, uh, by the end of this class especially, if I give you any arbitrary charge distribution in space, whether they're point charges or line charges, surface charges, volume charges, you should be able to take that and calculate the field distribution, or at least set up the field calculation, because the actual calculation itself is usually hideously complicated. And in this class, remember, and I'll show you some examples today, when you get to uh, um, the, the end, you don't have to evaluate. You just need to set it up, because that's really the most important thing, right? Co computers do all the computation parts, so if you set up the integral, that's as far as you need to take it. Computers can't set up integrals, though. You can't feed it a word problem and then have it you know, set up the integral for you. That's, that's actually thinking, not computation. Some of my students do not understand the difference between the two. So we will pick up. At the very end, I, I worked one basic example with a line charge. We had a straight line distribution between minus A and plus A. There's a bunch of positive charges uniformly distributed on that. And we came up with an integral to calculate it as a function of distance along the xy plane. And we found that we like one of the key results is that you know if you step really far away from it, it looks like a point charge. You just take all that point uh, charge, positive charge density, collapse it to a point, and the formula looked identical to the original Coulomb's law for a single point charge. That was a refreshing result. But there was a little more complicated behavior when we got close into it. Um, and, and our analysis picked that up through integration. So now let's work another example. It'll refresh our memories from last week. And this is going to be, let's see, we did a line charge. So now let's do a surface charge. And again, this is going to be one of those problems where We can actually get a final solution and evaluate the integral, but don't get too hopeful. You would never have to do this all the way on the test. So recognize that you only have to get about two-thirds of the way or halfway through this problem just setting it up um, if you're actually working this out on the test or even a homework. Most of the examples that I give you in the homework will not have nice, easy answers, and that's okay. So let's look at this. What is uh, the problem that we're going to do? This is the infinite uniform sheet of charge problem. It's a classic in all the physics and, and electromagnetics books. And the, the setup goes something like this. Let's say I've got the origin. Here's the x. Here's the y. Here's the z-axis. Yeah. Drew it right-handed. That's good. And in every direction, there is an infinite sheet of charge. I'm just going to draw arrows to denote that this all goes to infinity. And if this, the charge density on this sheet, a bunch of, say, positive charges, rho sub s, 
surface density in coulombs per meter squared. This will be a uniform sheet of charge, so rho sub s is not a function of space. If I observe it here or here or here, I get the same amount of charge kind of distributed across the sheet. Anytime you take a, like a big metal sheet and put charge on it, like the top plate of a capacitor, for example, it, the result that we get from this problem describes close into that, that uh, plate the field distribution. So this is actually a very useful canonical problem. In fact, we'll use it later in another problem, the result that we get from this. So uh, let's go ahead and set this up. Now, I know the last time we, we did this, we're going to find E field at any arbitrary point in space. And of course, recognize that my R vector is a three-dimensional position vector and is really just shorthand for electric field as a function of x and a function of y and a function of z space. And the integral that I gave for the surface charge density, you got to integrate across a surface S. In this case, S is going to be our infinite sheet. And we're integrating the surface charge density, rho sub s, which in the general sense could be a function of where I'm observing it, but in this case it's going to be a constant. And then my kernel, my Green's function, so to speak, is this r minus r vector divided by 4 pi epsilon naught magnitude r minus r prime vector quantity squared. And that's integrated with respect to whatever part elements of integration I pick up for my surface. Now remember, r is a point of observation. r prime contains the coordinates that we're integrating with respect to. It could be another Cartesian coordinate problem, so I'm just doing everything in x, y's, and z's. x, y, and z is the place where I'm observing. And that, point, that place will have some sort of field vector at that x uh, point to express the solution of the field in volts per meter. And it's the uh, x prime, y prime, z prime that I'll be sliding around to picking, picking out all of the contributions of the charge distribution. So this is the generic setup. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to make a couple of uh, simplifications here. First of all, we're integrating along x prime and y prime. We don't need to integrate with respect to z because this sheet of charge is on the xy plane, the z equals zero plane. And that means that my ds in that previous expression is going to be equal to dx prime, a dy prime. My r vector prime my point, uh, my variable of integration, let me just write this out. This is going to be x prime, stick it on the x, y prime, stick it on the y. And of course, z is always going to be 0, so I'll just put 0z zero there, recognizing I don't even really need to take that along for the ride. So that's my variable of integration. Let me write that down so we don't get confused. Variable of integration, because what we'll find is that all of these problems have these exact same steps that you kind of go through. You put your generic integral in there and you start substituting in everything, making simplifications along the way wherever helpful. This is my uh, element of surface integration. Let's see, what other things do I want to put in here? Well, my point of observation is going to be r equals to 0x hat plus 0y hat plus z, z hat. Why did I put zeros for x and y hat unit vectors? Well, I'm going to make a simplification here. Here goes something like this, right? Normally that would be x, 
on the X hat, Y on the Y hat, Z on the Z hat, because the problem asked for the E field everywhere. We want to find the E field anywhere above that plane. However, think about this. I'm standing atop an infinite uniform charge plane. My position is described by X, Y, and Z. I'm going to get some E field vector probably sticking up if it's a positive charge on that. I've got infinite charge all around me. If I move a little to the right, i.e. I increase my X position, and I look at my problem, it, it still looks like an infinite charge plane, right? Nothing's changed. And in fact, if I go backwards, if I move in Y backwards, uh, I see the same problem. I see an infinite amount of charge sheet around us. So really, this problem has what we call translational symmetry. It doesn't matter where you move in X or Y. It looks like the exact same problem. I will leave the Z component in there because as we move farther away, we would expect you know the charges down here to act on us less. Um, although we'll see that the, the result uh, contradicts that to give a little foreshadowing. But we'll just leave that in there for now. So in that case, my point of observation is this. That means that the magnitude of my point of observation minus my variable of integration is equal to the square root of z squared plus x prime squared plus y prime squared. And that's because my x and my y are gone from my point of observation, and my z is gone from my variable of integration. So when I subtract the two vectors from one another and square the components up, that's my, what my Pythagorean theorem yields. Everybody tracking so far? Makes perfect sense, right? We're just setting things up. OK. Now, I'm going to plug in E as a function of 0, 0, z at the point 0, 0, z, which we of course know is the same as e as a function of x, y, and z because of the translational symmetry, is going to be equal to, when I put that integral in, I get the integral. I'm going to go ahead. I like to do this whenever I integrate with, multi, with uh, multiple variables. I like to put the little elements of integration here so you know exactly what limits they correspond to. I like it. I had an EMAG professor that did that to me, so of course I replicate his quirks all the way through my lecture in, in many cases. So we're going to be integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity in both x and y, picking up all the contributions with our variable of integration as we slide around there. OK, rho sub s is a constant. So you know what? I'm going to bring it out here for now. In fact, 4 pi epsilon uh, naught is a constant. I guess we're assuming this is in free space, so there's no stuff that would make epsilon something other than epsilon naught. And of course, what I got here, I have... Uh, R, I got to take R minus R prime in the numerator. Well, that's 0, 0 plus Z Z hat minus R prime, which we said was X prime on the X hat plus Y prime on the Y hat. And then you divide by this distance here, raised to the third power. OK. So this is the integral. This is where we're at so far. OK, so I can make some more simplifications here due to symmetry. So right now, I'm integrating. This is actually three different integrals, right? I've got a component on my z hat unit vector. So I could kind of break that off into an integral. If I distribute the, su the summation here, I got a minus x prime x hat. And I can 
make that sort of its own double integral. And I got another one, it's y prime times y hat. And I can make that a third integral. And this starts to look like it would be a very difficult problem. However, what's the nice thing about this? We've got some symmetry going on here. And remember last time we applied some symmetry arguments to our line charge problem. And there are always two ways to do it. One is with geometrical intuition. And the other one with is, is with mathematical intuition. So let me start with geometrical intuition, because this is the way I think. I like ge geometry. And I can think better in geometry than I can in algebra. So I'm at a point above the charge plane. I'm going to slide around, and that, those positive charges over there are going to make an E field that contributes this way. The positive charges over there are going to make an E field that contributes this way. Positive charges down there are kind of going to make an E field contribute that way. What's it all going to add up to? Well, by symmetry, I have exactly the same amount of charge on this side of the world as I do on this side of the world in this particular problem. So if I think about all the charges over here that are going to push my E field this way, are going to balance out with all the charges over here that are going to push my E field this way, the resultant should only have the Z component. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mathematically, you could argue the same thing. You say, well, we're going from minus infinity to plus infinity of minus x prime over something that's a function of x prime. But it's, this is a x prime squared raised to the 3 half power. It's always going to be positive, whether x prime is positive or negative. 1 over this stuff is actually an even function. But when I put an x prime in the, denom uh, in the numerator, on one side of the world it's positive, on the other side of the world it's negative. And so it's an, it becomes an odd function in its totality. If I, if I integrate an odd mathematical function from minus infinity to plus infinity, I have to get 0. Because all the negative stuff is going to cancel with the positive stuff on the other side. That's just the mathematical way to express the same symmetry argument we just worked through. Likewise, y is the same way. y prime is going to have uh, symmetry to it. Uh, odd symmetry to it when it's taken with this positive, always positive denominator. And so integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity, whatever you wind up with, is going to give you uh, zero. So we have just saved ourselves two whole integrations when integrated. So let's go ahead and take a look now. page back here at the final exam uh, final result e as a function of x y and z is going to be equal to rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon naught and that's going to integrate multiplied by the integral dx prime from minus infinity to plus infinity as well dy prime and you know what that that non-zero integral with just the z in front of it z and z prime are like constants we're not integrating with respect to them so we're going to take them out too and finally what we're left with is one over z squared plus x prime squared plus y prime squared raised to the 3 halves power. If you were working on your test and solving this problem on a test, you could stop here. Because this is as simple as we can get it without actually uh, evaluating the integral. It turns out this integral isn't too bad. There are actually formulas in the back of your calculus book that you could apply for it, uh, apply to it and simplify it. Now, what are those formulas? I'll go ahead and show you. Let's see, if we do the x integral first, that's how I did it in my notes for some reason. It doesn't matter what you do first. are going to wind up being the same. Now, these, these can be commuted, of course. So let's do x first. We look at the back of the book. The back of the book says that this should be x prime over the square root of z squared plus x prime squared 
plus y prime squared. And of course, this has to be evaluated. This is the indefinite integral, so we've got to evaluate it between the two limits, from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is actually really easy, because in the limit of x prime very large, you can basically ignore this other stuff. So you really have the square root of a really big x prime squared, which of course is just x prime itself. And you're dividing it by x prime. So when x is equal to plus infinity, this evaluates to 1. When you evaluate at negative infinity, it evaluates to negative 1 in the limit. So you got 1 minus a minus 1. This whole thing evaluates to plus 2. Oh, and I forgot there's a little constant out here that we have to take into account. This is also part of the integration, but it doesn't have an x term in it. z squared plus y prime squared. So now I have 2 times this. Well, again, I have to go back to the back of the calculus book and take a look at the final result. Let me first take this 2 out, cancel it with that 4 there, partially, so that I have 2 pi in my denominator. Rho sub s, z, z prime, and an epsilon naught in the denominator. Now this, this guy here, his definite integral is arctangent. So this whole thing here evaluates to 1 over z arctangent y prime over z. And this is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. We're evaluating that term right there. So minus, inf uh, let's see, positive infinity. If I take the arctangent of positive infinity, what do I get? Pi over 2, 90 degrees. Well, that's where tangent blows up to infinity. When I evaluate it at minus infinity, what does it go to? Minus pi over 2. That's where it blows up negative. So I have pi over 2 minus a minus pi over 2 when I evaluate this. That's the same thing as pi, two halves of a pi. So this should be pi. So that pi is going to cancel with that. And what I am left with in my final answer Pi's are going to cancel. I got a z in the numerator and a z in the denominator that I can cancel. My final solution is this. And this is for z above the zero uh, plane. Now talk about that for a minute. What do we got going on? What, is it, what result did we find? This is actually a very simple result, and it's a very elegant as well. What we find is that the electric field above a sheet of charge points directly up. There's no x or no y component. Of course, it's proportional to the charge density. Double the charge density, double the field strength. And what's more, it becomes independent of all the positions, not just x and y because of the translational symmetry, but also z. Does that make sense? The field drops as I move away from an infinite charge sheet? Well, if you think about it, it does, right? Because if I'm close to this charge sheet with the uniform density, then this charge right here is really, really strong. You know, the stuff right below me, the, all those little bits of charge contribute 1 over r squared, 1 over distance squared. And so they're contributing most of my upward for, uh, forcing uh, E field. If I move away from this and start to get a bird's eye view, that charge doesn't contribute much anymore. But I see a broader area below me, and a lot of that charge all the way over there that was kind of mostly pushing my field this way, and that charge over here that was mostly pushing my field this way, canceling each other out, are now pushing forward like this. And so there's sort of like a scalability uh, uh, problem here. Like you know, we sort of pick up more charge from the outside as we move away from it, and it perfectly counterbalances itself. So we get a uniform field above a plane of uh, charge.
That's a fundamental result, and very useful for things like analyzing things like capacitors and things like that. If you look at a, any type of sheet with charge on it, if you wanted to model the field strength in a capacitor, generally if you're underneath that, that sheet, the field strength will look nearly constant. Uh, let's see. You were first, I think. Can you go again why, how you can take out the Oh, uh, how we could take these uh, x prime and y prime out of the integral? No, taking z z hat out of the integral. Oh, z z hat. Well, these are constant, right? We're integrating with respect to x prime and y prime, but this is just a unit vector. It doesn't have any dependence when you're talking about Cartesian unit vectors. It does not have any dependence on your point of observation or your variable of integration. It always points in the same direction. So I can pop this out. And then, of course, this is, my, this is uh, my point of observation, not my variable of integration. So I can actually move that out as well. It gets confusing, and that's one of the reasons why I emphasize always put primes on your variables of integration in this class. Because if you just get careless and you start dropping primes or start adding them where you start, uh, they're not supposed to be, it completely changes the result. You wouldn't make, be able to make that really nice simplification. Did you have a question? Yeah. In this class, are we going to have to deal with non-uniform uh, potentially, potentially, you'd have to set up a problem like that. Um, but like I said, the last board work of work, uh, the last board of work that we did would have been unnecessary. You wouldn't have had to evaluate it. Simplify, but don't evaluate. Maybe I'll do a numerical assignment later in the class where you actually have to evaluate one of these on a computer. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Look at the field solution around. Uh, charge distribution. A lot of fun, fun problems there. OK. Now keep in mind, this solution is good for just above the charge. It's the exact same expression if you're below the charge sheet. It just points downward. Always points away from positive charges, towards negative charges, you feel.